Perfect. Okay, so welcome everyone to my fun, fun seminar on social issues and corporation, um, which is going to be a based on like quite a few different social issues and how each of them interact with corporation uh, because we're just coming out of pride month and it's like the beginning of July or it was, it was going to be the beginning of July we're like closer to the middle now I do want to focus a decent amount of the seminar on rainbow capitalism and the harms that that can bring and like what that is in general so as you can see by my lovely subtitle there so yeah um I like I guess if there's any questions feel free to like pop them in chat um and i will do my best to answer them but also we will definitely have like an actual question period at the end uh but yes okay so let me go through what we're going to be talking about because i made a fun agenda so first i want to define a few terms um they're mostly going to be things that are like important that i'll be saying a lot related to the seminar and then i want to go into rainbow capitalism how black lives matter intersects with corporations, how indigenous issues intersect with corporations, how feminism intersects with corporations, and lastly on environmental issues. Um, and those are basically the six things that we're going to be going through today. And I'll do my best to keep this like not crazy long because, you know, I think we do want to do a debate, but yes. All right. So the first thing I want to talk about really quickly is what corporate social responsibility is. And I'm sure many of you already know something like, okay. Anyway, corporate social responsibility is important for the context of this um, seminar and explains a little bit as to where corporations are coming from. So what is it? Corporate social responsibility is basically by definition, an international private business self-regulation that aims to contribute to societal goals of a philanthropic activist or charitable nature by engaging in or supporting volunteering or ethically oriented practices. And then just like simple words, that's basically when corporations try to look like they're doing good things. So a few examples of corporate social responsibility is them taking on initiatives of like making our offices green or um, being more ethical with where we source our products or any of the sort of things that they do when they're trying to replace plastic straws with paper one any of those sort of things that they decide to do in order to make themselves more socially responsible so try to benefit society um, in whatever way that they can as a corporation and that's essentially what corporate social responsibility is, which is inherently what every single corporation is trying to do when we're talking about social issues. So whenever you see a corporation doing anything for any social issue, that in itself is them trying to practice corporate social responsibility, which is like, I guess, something that we should probably hold businesses to. And it's probably a good thing that some of them care about social issues. But as I'll be explaining through the rest of the seminar, a lot of the times that cannot end very well. Anyway, but we can't get into that without talking about the reasons why they do things like corporate social responsibility. And this sort of framing is incredibly crucial in any debate round that you're going to be talking about any sort of um, corporate like incentive or whatever when it comes to why they're doing the sort of things that they're doing. What's key about corporate social responsibility is the reason why it exists for the most part is for branding. It is for the ability for um, corporations to say that they're doing good things in order to attract more customers, especially with millennials and especially with people in Generation Z, the younger generations are like, you know, any teenagers and like 20 something, like these people care more about being ethical and like there's like a trend towards things like woke culture and stuff like that, which is where corporations are able to recognize that a lot of their potential markets are aware of social issues, so they want to seem good to them in order to get more of that, um, in order to get more of that market so that they're able to make more money, essentially. So a lot of the time it isn't out of the good of their hearts and it isn't necessarily to benefit the social movement is purely for their own branding which is why a lot of the initiatives that they're going to take on are a lot more like blankety and a lot more vague without actually doing anything to help them and i know that sounds a little bit harsh but i promise i'll explain this a little bit more as we get further into this seminar um okay so the second thing that i want to talk about is performative activism because 
A lot of corporations be doing that as well as a lot of people in general. So what is performative activism? According to Google, uh, performative activism is a pejorative term referring to activism done to increase one's social capital rather than because of one's devotion to a cause. It is often associated with surface level activism referred to as slacktivism, except I have never heard anyone ever say the word slacktivism. But yeah, okay. So the performative activism is essentially when people try to appear woke or, or try to appear like they care about social issues without doing anything substantial. So a lot of corporations take on a lot of different levels of performative activism um, because they do a lot of these sort of things where they will, for example, well, they'll like fly a rainbow flag for pride without actually trying to help LGBTQ plus people. Um, and it's also really common on social media. And I'm sure many of you have seen on Instagram and like all of their fun um, graphics where they're talking about an issue that a lot of the time doesn't go necessarily that in depth or anything like that. But that's also really common to performative activism. And there was also a lot of performative activism last year. I think it was last year, during the Black Lives Matter protests that happened after George Floyd was murdered by police. Um, so there's a lot of stuff that happens regarding performative activism. So why, why do people do performative activism? So a huge reason is um, because a lot of allies want to feel good. So a lot of the time, individuals who are not directly related to a specific social movement. So let's say that you are a straight person who supports the queer community who is, or supports the LGBTQ plus community. A lot of people um, will want to feel good about themselves and to feel charitable so that they will do things like performative activism so they can basically adapt to some level of being an activist without actually risking anything of their own, without like risking their own image. Because a lot of the time doing things like performative activism necessarily means that their image gets better and people will see that and people will be like, oh, this person is so cool. And in actuality, they're not doing a lot. But that's why performative activism is viewed by a lot of allies in order to make themselves feel like they're actually part of the movement. Um, Another reason is basically like they want to fit in. If they see a lot of people posting about any specific thing, uh, they'll also want to post in order to like go on with the bandwagon. But they also just want to seem like good people. And that's where performative activism comes out a lot. And as I'll explain later in the seminar, it is sometimes can be really harmful. So getting um, into a little bit about their harms and things like that. So first of all, it doesn't really do anything. And which case, like a lot of the times, posting a picture on social media won't lead to any real substantial change, right? Like just because you're posting something, for example, for Blackout Tuesday and you're posting a black screen doesn't mean you're actually aiding the Black Lives Matter movement. And a really good example of this is when a lot of individuals last year during the protest posted their black screen for Blackout Tuesday using the hashtag, hashtag Black Lives Matter, it meant that a lot of the posts for where people were actually using social media in order to form protests and in order to like communicate with the people around them, a lot of those posts got shadowed because so many people were posting this black screen with the same hashtag. So people couldn't find um, where these protests were actually happening, which limited the communicational ability for these movements. And that's a really big harm. Um, but also it's just like, you're not really doing anything when you're posting any sort of stuff. But it also just limits nuance. A lot of the time, and this is not necessarily inherent to Instagram, but this happens a lot on Instagram. A lot of the material that they're going to be posting on Instagram, and I'm sure most of you have seen this, they're all typically really like buzzwordy and they typically have like one or two sentences, like we stand with you or, you know, um, have like a slogan or whatever. So it limits a lot of nuance because it's just as much as individuals are trying to educate people on social media, it is really difficult to explain a really complex issue or like it, that like it takes essays and there's so many essays written about these sort of things and then needing to condense that all into one social media post that can be really difficult. So a lot of the times the nuance can be missing. I guess an example of this is just that like it's a lot harder for um 
individuals, let's say in the LGBTQ plus community that aren't part of the first two le letters, where there are typically like more posts centering on certain sexualities and more people are educated on certain sexualities, except that there's a lot of different things. And specifically asexuality is one of the examples where people don't necessarily know a lot about it. And that isn't helped by the fact that most of the posts that you see on social media when it comes to pride and stuff like that is about a few of those specific letters that doesn't necessarily show the entire community and doesn't necessarily help every single part of that community so it limits nuance um and all the next harm that can happen which is it comes from an ingenuine place it, like and this can be connected to something known as white guilt one thing I want to point out, this isn't to say that white people can't be good allies to racialized minorities or anything like that, but there is a lot of times where a lot of individuals who are Caucasian and who are white who can basically feel guilty for some of the things that minorities have gone through, specifically when it comes to racism and stuff like that, that they will, um, I guess, make it about themselves in a way whenever they're doing this sort of activism. This isn't to say that like, you know, all white people who support Black Lives Matter are automatically bad activists. That, that's not the point that I'm trying to make, but there is an overwhelming trend of individuals who will be doing this sort of thing in order to like, I guess, free their own guilt because in some aspects they feel like, you know, they're culpable in these sort of issues that have been happening and then instead of like writing or like instead of trying their best to help the movement they'll make it about themselves and a lot of times they'll talk about rhetoric about like oh like you know I just feel so bad as like a white person instead of amplifying racialized voices who really need these sort of I guess platform that allies can give to them. So that's another harm of performative activism. And also it just uses a movement to help image and help your image. And it's just never good to co-op like an actual really important issue in order to help yourself feel better. Um, especially because like a lot of performative activism uh, once again, doesn't have that sort of nuance. So it's not actually amplifying the voices of the individuals in the movement who necessarily need it the most. Okay, now I think I've, crapped on performative activism enough for like the past 10 minutes. So I guess I'll talk a little bit about what some of these pros can be in order to help you guys out in debate round. So I guess one of the big things is more people can know about this sort of movement. Um, and like, this is a little bit difficult to tread as well, just because a lot of the times like when something really big happens and it's in the media, so for example, um, the Black Lives Matter protest last year, they always like trend for a certain amount of time or like trend for a certain amount of time before a lot of the attention shifts away from them, um, which means that people will know more about it in the given time frame, And that can be really good. Like there were so many donations that were given to like Black Lives Matter activists and stuff like that during the period of time of which Black Lives Matter was something that was talked about a lot um, on social media. So they did get like a decent amount of support from that. And they got like a decent amount of resources because people were more likely to donate to something that they were seeing a lot about. Um, but also that means that it eventually does like fall off in a few months or like a few year, like a few months, a few weeks, whatever. So I, to a certain extent, yes, more people know about it, which can be really good. Um, um, but also just recognize that when more people know about it, it often comes at a cost of in a, the, in a few months, in a few weeks, people stop caring as much about it. The second pro that I want to talk about is the Overton window. And I'm sure there's been many seminars, specifically, I know Tyler gives a really good seminar on this, but in short, the Overton window is basically a specific like range of what issues are able to be discussed like comfortably. So for example, um, there are a lot of things that have happened in the past that are now no longer acceptable, like things like slavery. So that has shifted out of the Overton window and it's not something that you would ever discuss in politics um, as like the general public or what generally is ac acceptable, right? So when we have 
more like people who care about activism, even if it is more performative, it means the Overton window can be shifted a little bit more to the left in order to accommodate for more things that can be talked about comfortably in like public forum or like, you know, in the social sphere without people being like, oh, that's just crazy. Um, so there's always an Overton window with things that can be discussed social issues wise. Um, and it can be shift and if it shift a little bit more towards social issues that can often be good um, and that can also come from performative activism just because of the fact that more people know about it and more people want to accept it um, because at some level with performative activism people will accept talking about the things that they're trying to be activists for even if that activism is a little bit shallow so those are some harms and some pros about performative activism but now I really want to get into rainbow capitalism. And I'll like watch myself and make sure I don't just rant for this entire section. But what is rainbow capitalism? I've also included like a lot of pictures of examples just because there's been a lot of them this year. But yes. So rainbow capitalism is the incorporation of the LGBTQ plus movement, sexual diversity, and pinkwashing to capitalism, consumerism, gentrification, and the market economy, viewed especially in a critical lens as this incorporation pertains to the LGBT, Western, white, and affluent upper middle class communities and market. So basically, rainbow capitalism is pandering to LGBTQ plus people in order for corporations to get them to buy their stuff. Um, and it's like a huge marketing scheme during June. Like, I, I don't know how much you guys walked around this Pride Month, um, which was last month, but like there were a lot of rainbow flags like on various streets in places where there's a lot of companies. Like I remember walking through downtown Oakville and like every restaurant had like a pride flag. Um, and there was like this one Expedia cruise thing that had a bunch of like small flies flags. But basically like a lot of that is based on branding. Um, and it, a lot of the times like that kind of branding only pertains to like a specific part of the LGBTQ plus movement, which as the definition states, can, tends to be more Western, white, and affluent and upper middle class community, um, which, you know, isn't very representative of what the LGBTQ plus movement is. But that's what rainbow capitalism and I'm gonna show you some examples now. A huge one is TD Canada Trust because TD has TD Pride most of the time, um, not during as much COVID, but like a decent amount of the time they have TD Pride where they help hold like the Pride celebration, but that's rainbow capitalism. As you can see, the things are painted rainbow. Uh, another example is Doritos because now they have rainbow Doritos. Um, there was a huge thing about the Lego pride collection, I guess, where you had like a rainbow and I couldn't find the meme, but there's this really funny meme where it's like corporation during pride month and this, this picture corporation after pride month. And it's like, it looks like it's them painting everything white again, but that's a really good like way to um, reference how corporations care about queer people and LGBTQ plus people or show that they care about them for one month of the year and then every other month is just like ah, whatever um, and then there's the Skittles one where everything is white in order to support pride I guess um, here are some more examples so yeah another thing when it comes to rainbow capitalism is what's known as pride merch and i actually i can show you guys some pride merch because i went and got myself a buy flag a few years back so there's this but basically in accordance to this seminar the thing with pride merch is basically any sort of merchandise that you can buy around pride that has rainbows on it that have like your specific flag for your specific identity on it um and like shirts like there's like rainbow thigh highs, which I, and then there's like tank tops. Like there's a lot of different merchandise that a lot of companies sell in order to pander to LGBTQ plus people who want pride merch. And that can often be really problematic and not the most representative because a lot of the time they play into some very harmful stereotypes. Like I I don't remember where I saw this and I don't remember who told me about this um but there was basically like this one shirt for like gay men that something 
like it wrote on it like you know it will turn you gay and I think I might have like honestly talked to George about this but basically it can be really yikes a lot of the time because they can pander into some really yeah, like bad stereotypes when it comes to for example for this specific one would be gay men are always predatory like these are all stereotypes that rainbow capitalism can often like kind of support and it's really not good but also it's really problematic because a lot of the time this sort of rainbow capitalism can be co-opted by big companies so that means you know big corporations will be able to make a lot of money off of queer people who want pride merch because they have the resources in order to mass produce this sort of thing but it also means that it's typically harder for queer artists to get their merch seen and that's and that like harms those small queer businesses because a lot of the time their merch can be more expensive because they're homemade or like better quality um so you know that's not really great and a huge thing is because queer people are really underrepresented in the media, and I guess it's getting better, but still, like, they're underrepresented, um, and so a lot of the times when it comes to Pride, and because Pride is supposedly this huge celebration that also has been co-opted by a lot of big companies such as TD, where they help host the parade every year, which also makes them money, but because there are these sort of events, queer people really want merch, so a lot of the times it is just easier to get one from big companies, which is how, like, these larger companies are able to benefit so much off of things like Pride and then things like Rainbow Capitalism, which just isn't really fun, but it's essentially what happens, and it can be really harmful. Um, so here are some examples that I really don't like, <clears throat> sorry, about some kind of Ugh, stereotypes. For example, the I just look straight sweater, which is really just not, not good. But these are just some examples of, you know, pride merch that big companies want to create and what they think that queer people like. Um, note that there is literally a Make America Great Again hat with like a rainbow font on it, where none of these sort of ways uh, for companies to show their activism necessarily even helps queer people to begin with. These are just some harmful messages that can be shown through Pride merch and a lot of the times this is what big companies end up producing and things like that, which is not, not fantastic. And I could go on, I could show you guys a lot more of these examples, but I will move on now because there's a lot to get through. So why is it bad? Um, the simple answer is that these corporations don't really help uh, LGBTQ plus rights, right? Like it's also important to recognize that a lot of these corporations donate to a lot of really anti-LGBTQ plus things such as conversion camps, cough, cough, Chick-fil-A, cough, cough. But these corporations don't help. And um, a lot of the times it becomes really bad because then they're making money all out of a lot of queer people and then they then exploit these queer people through things like donating the money that they have made to these sort of um organizations that support conversion therapy which is just not it's not good um the second reason why this can be bad is they can often claim the message for themselves so a lot of the times this doesn't shine any light on the actual issues that affect lgbtq plus people which is like really multifaceted and a lot of the times like they try to show homophobia but they don't necessarily show homophobia in a lot of the ways that like it actually exists so they tend to gloss over the fact about how a lot of black trans women are murdered they gloss over the hate crimes that exist and a lot of the time they like will try to show you this really pretty picture of white queer people coming out to their parents and then their parents being accepting so basically in short they can claim the message for themselves and not actually talk about the nuanced issues that a lot of these queer people face and this is especially bad during pride month if all of the messages about queer people that you see are done through these major corporations or are done through these shallow commercials it doesn't actually like help the actual queer people who are probably trying to do educational things during pride um and it's just not not fun so then another reason is it makes them money 
because a lot of the times they are genuinely able to profit off of marginalized groups and they profit off the fact that there is so much underrepresentation of queer people when it comes to things like being able to buy pride flags, being able to buy shirts with like a rainbow on them, that they decide that like we should do this during Pride Month and they'll make a lot of money. Okay, and this also specifically supports some very specific parts of the community. Um, so a lot of the time, the ads that exist about queer people typically only features the first two letters, which is L lesbian and gay people. They don't talk about trans people a lot of the times. They don't talk about asexuality. They don't talk about um, bisexuality, I guess is getting more media attention, but they don't talk about pansexuality. They don't talk about non-binary people. So they don't talk about a lot of the different parts of the community. Um, and if you've ever seen like a pride, Vid, like video as I've talked about before, it really doesn't show you the actual struggle that these individuals face. And then lastly, it's often just really lazy, right? Like a lot of the times these corporations are just like slapping a rainbow on their logo. Like there was just one post that I saw about them literally just photoshopping chicken nuggets to make them look rainbow. It's just not really like doing anything and they can get like so much support for that. Like a lot of people are going to be like and a lot of people who aren't as educated about the nuances of queer issues, a lot of potential ally see these sort of like things with like a rainbow flag on them and they're immediately like wow this is what pride stands for this is so good without actually understanding the different parts of the community and why that can be bad so that is just a lot of reasons as to why rainbow capitalism is not very good um <clears throat> yeah and that's a lot of the ways that corporations then interact with social issues right they try to take the message for themselves in order to benefit their own branding um without regarding the multitude of things that they can do in order to harm these things, which we've already talked about. So let's talk a little bit about what these people can do instead um, and how corporations can interact with the queer community in order to like benefit them. Um, and this is not like a extensive list. Like this is, I got from one article because like I do think like some of these have pretty good point. So the first one is demanding workplace policies to develop inclusive work environments. And I also just want to point out that this is like, I guess, benefits that you can make like when you are a corporation specifically. Um, there is a lot of like just casual homophobia that can happen in work environments uh, and like heteronormativity and stuff like that. So trying to get better policies in order to protect individuals and or in order to like make sure they're not discriminated against is really good. Hiring queer people at all levels, including high level corporate positions. There is like a severe lack of individuals who, <clears throat> oh my gosh, who are queer in like high level corporate positions. So there's not a lot of CEOs who are like that and stuff like that. A lot of the time they might be like, you know, lower ranking on the corporate ladder. Um, it's also just like, planning and running community events or like giving safer spaces to these LGBTQ plus people in order to make sure that they're actually able to like live their life. Um, and also like creating and partnership and mentorship initiatives with queer businesses is a huge thing. Cause there's a lot of like small queer businesses whether that be tattoo shops, whether that be like places to buy merch that can definitely be benefited through like added funding and donation that companies probably can do, um, giving more opportunities to queer youth. So internships through universities and high school can definitely also help. And also just like giving better grants to individuals who are entrepreneurs. And also, I just want to point out that all of these things are related specifically to companies. So there's a lot of other things that companies could then be doing in order to relate to more like broader aspects. So whenever they're doing corporate social responsibility, when it comes to the LGBTQ plus people, instead of just slapping on a rainbow, maybe they can donate to these initiatives such as, um, you know, like queer homeless shelters for youth or, um, you know, putting more resources into being able to help individuals who are trying to like medically transition. Like there's so many different things that they could be doing. Like there's so many different ways that they could be spending their money instead of just running a marketing scheme that has rainbows on things. But the point is there are better ways for corporations to engage with the LGBTQ plus community during pride. And a huge thing that they should be doing more is consulting individuals in the community and consulting individuals that aren't seen as much in the community in order to really help them out in order to like really um 
get better at these sort of aspects. And these are all mechanisms that you guys can use in debate rounds and when you're talking about what corporations should do instead, because a lot of the times people will be like, oh, but you don't have an alternative for whatever you're arguing for. Um, and this is just a few different things that you can say in order to say that like there are genuine things that corporations could be doing for queer people, but they don't. Um, so yeah, now I wanna talk a little bit about, about whoa, Black Lives Matter. So why this is still something that's really important. Police brutality is unfortunately still very, 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 very common. And it's not just a United States issue. And I think that especially us as Canadians, we should all try our best to accept the fact and to really research into the way that the police operates within Canada, because there is still a lot, a lot of racism in Canada. And a lot of the times they affect a lot of the vulnerable members of our communities, whether that be Black people, whether that be Indigenous people, which I will also get into on later on in the seminar. Um, many communities are then over-policed and gentrified, and basically that just means that a lot of the times corporations or like places will then try to take over more and more parts of a community that has a lot of individuals who are like maybe of a lower socioeconomic status and maybe a racial minority and then a lot of the time they'll like buy that land and then um, change it to something that is less affordable for these individuals and these communities, which is what gentrification essentially is. Um, and make sure you're making sure you're also educating yourself on the history of police. <clears throat> reveals a lot about what their goals actually are and what they actually want to do when it comes to policing. So what should you do? You should educate yourself. And when I say try to educate yourself, I mean do it yourself. I think a lot of the time the people who genuinely want to understand these sort of social issues, what they'll end up doing is that they're not going to like research themselves. And a lot of the times they tend to ask individuals who are part of that community for their advice, which is like, obviously like good consult these individuals but when you're consulting them make sure you're consulting people who genuinely like want to do so because no one is obligated to give you a response so when you're educating yourself make sure you turn more to like google and resources that are accessible to you like there are plenty of activists who would be happy to like you know talk about the sort of activism that they're doing just make sure you're trying to seek them out so yeah, educate yourself, um, support black owned businesses and causes. So once you do that research, you can probably find a lot of these black owned businesses who would love to like have your business and stuff like that. Donations slash protesting is always helpful when it comes to activism and just also don't speak over black voices. But yes, this is my very quick interlude about Black Lives Matter. Um, and now I will get into a little bit of like historical context when it's regarding the different types of corporations and how they interact with Black Lives Matter. A lot of corporations have had a lot of issues when it comes to race, racism. Like there are genuinely still retail stores that will keep a closer eye on black people as well as indigenous people because they're more worried that they're going to steal something which is a stereotype that is really harmful and that is definitely not good um in the past textured hair products used to be locked in the case in places like walmart because they thought the individuals who would be using them would be more likely to steal them um there are still issues with rage gap sorry wage gaps when it comes to how black women are being paid and how black men are being paid like versus their counterpart. Um, there are also still a lot of diversity issues in companies and a lot of this plays into the stereotypes that exist already about, about black people, which is just really not good. And oftentimes like the stereotypes that exist then harm black people's ability to make it up the corporate ladder. And that's just a lot of other things that are going on. Another thing when it comes to how Black Lives Matter intersects with corporations is that a lot of beauty companies have had a, issues with products that are not inclusive. So for anyone who uses makeup in this call, and I'm not sure how many of you there are, but they've always had like, Black people have always had a really hard time finding foundation and finding concealer, which is the things that you like use to make your skin seem more smooth that actually match their skin tone, because a lot of the time the foundation doesn't aren't is not dark enough for their skin. And a lot of the times, even when those sort of shades exist, there's often like a really small selection compared to like the 
15, 20 different shades for individuals with lighter skin tone. Um, so that's often a lot of problems when it comes to beauty companies. But also hair products is a huge thing. Like a lot of the time um, when you go into like a lot of stores, it's difficult to find hair products that help textured hair more. And a lot of the times those products can be more expensive, um, which is also just really not good. And finally, when it comes to beauty companies, there's still a really prevalent issue of what is regarded as beautiful and not beautiful, especially in places like Canada and the US and like in Western nations in general, they're still upholding a lot of European beauty standards that basically look at a lot of the parts of minority spaces that they don't think is necessarily as desirable, which is also something that is a huge issue. But the word, but another thing when it regarding these beauty standards is that there are now features that are more prevalent on like racialized individuals, whether that be like Asian eyes or like black girls lips that are now viewed as more acceptable, but oftentimes it's only when a white person has those sort of like facial features and that's another issue in itself but context wise there's been a lot of issues between beauty companies and being able to be inclusive towards individuals who are racialized and then I also just want to talk a little bit about Disney because I do think that they've done a lot of like really crappy things that we should definitely talk about like there's a lot of racial stereotypes in many of their older movies like Fantasia has like a really problematic scene that has since been cut out um and just there is a lot of instances of Disney just not being very very good and I know that a lot of these things might have happened 50 60 years ago but since these are still media that we consume and that movies that we still watch it's always important to have a critical eye when it comes to consuming this type of media but that is just another example of a corporation that has been not very good when it comes to things like racism and it comes to things like Black Lives Matter and this specific social issue so let's talk a little bit about what happened last year there was a well, as I said at the beginning of the seminar there was a lot of performative activism last year um, companies were posting a lot on social media about how much they support Black Lives Matter and how much they supported the protest but then they got called out a lot for the fact that they weren't doing any real change um, because like they weren't donating or they were only posting for like blackout tuesday or anything like that which can definitely fall into performative activism but i just want to talk a little bit about ben and jerry's really quickly um because like kind of kind of kind of good content i gotta say so if you go to the ben and jerry's website there's like a huge part where it's like, you got to dismantle white supremacy. And they wrote a lot of stuff about Black Lives Matter um, during the protests because they've also been supporting this for years. And the two like owners of the company like got arrested for protesting, which is like pretty cool, I guess. But also that's not to say that the, they're, still, they're still like a company that really um, needs profit. So, you know, their ice cream is still like $8 for like this much, right? And then it's like a privilege in order to be able to access or sort of like contents or whatever, which I guess is basically my way of saying that even when a company is practicing activism in like a fairly good way and doing these sort of things, at the end of the day, they are still a corporation that is doing their best to gain as much profit as they can. So maybe this is just my way of saying that like, always be aware and always be careful when it comes to just interacting with corporations in general and just like their incentives are always really important to categorize and characterize sorry in debate rounds and they often can be really helpful to understand how these corporations think but also just recognize that there are examples of good activism that corporations can do, but it's also just like the fact of the matter is they are still a corporation who is still primarily concerned um, about like, um, like profit. And just because they're good with one specific social issue doesn't mean they're a blanket statement, a good company, because as Easton said in chat, like they're also long-term supporters of Israeli settlements in Palestine, which is just not very good. So there are a lot of nuances that come into characterizing these sort of companies. Um, and it's always important to remember that just because 
they can do one good thing doesn't mean that everything else they're doing is good. So apply your thinking hat whenever you are talking about corporations, especially in debates. Having nuanced characterization of these things are, is extremely important. And all this information can definitely help you with that. OK, now I want to talk a little bit about Indigenous issues. Um, quick interlude about Indigenous issues as a whole. Canada sucks when it comes to this specific thing. We have had such a bad, bad, bad history with how we have treated Indigenous people. Like, there was first just colonization in the South, but there's also just like the whole stuff with residential schools and the fact that they're still like finding children's bodies in the like around the property of residential schools. There was a 60s scoop. There was, um, there still is missing and murdered indigenous women. There still is pretty bad living conditions on a lot of reserves. And there still is really high rates of suicide. So our country, as much as it wants to pride itself on being inclusive, has a lot of things that aren't really good. Like there's a lot of issues that the Canadian government has had with things like reconciliation and which fact that a lot of indigenous activists don't even think reconciliation can be done anymore just because of the massive amounts of the horrendous things that the Canadian government has done to them. And this isn't just inherent to Canada. The United States also has a lot of issues with this. Any country that has colonized that is like has been colonized has a lot of issues with this. Um, so yeah, educate yourself on the sort of Canadian history that exists. It's really messed up, but I really recommend doing more research on your own. And I really recommend becoming more educated on this. And like, you know, maybe if I have time or maybe if someone else wants to do a whole seminar on indigenous issues, I'm sure we will have that at some point in this year. But that's my quick interlude about being aware of these sort of indigenous issues that exist. Now I want to talk about companies and indigenous people. And this sort of like has a little bit to do with environmental issues, but I will focus more on environmental issues when I get to that part. But corporate activity greatly harms their way of life for indigenous people because a lot of these individuals like have cultures that they want to uphold and have ways that they like live. So they may hunt, they may like do more um activities that like rely more on nature and the environment. So companies and specifically oil companies and mining companies that mine, drill, dam, and deforest, like put in pesticides, um, like have proliferation from agribusiness, like water privatization and appropriation, and just a range of other activities that are carried out on or near indigenous people's lands without their free prior and informed consent really hurt their ability to live. Um, because a lot of the time their land isn't respected by the government or by these corporations, which means that they oftentimes don't have the ability to consent to these sort of things. Um, and their ability to consent to like the corporation activities has been taken away from them. So then corporate activity harms their way of life and corporations have long since been very um like they've used a lot of indigenous land and that is really just not good um it's also important to talk about canada specifically here uh and there was like 2020 canadian pipeline and railway protests um that happened last year which you know, was basically about a pipeline that was going to be built on indigenous land without their actual consent. There's been a lot of oil spills that have hurt their ability to get food, that have hurt their water. Um, and then there's also the fact that because of the fact that corporations are doing a lot of like greenhouse gases and a lot of like polluting in general, a lot of this has accumulated in climate change, which is melting permafrost, which in Canada is where close to where they live, which means that there are like toxins and there are things that live in permafrost that can be really harmful to people that are melting because of the fact that climate change is happening. So that's also hurting their health. Um, so that's how corporations kind of interact with indigenous people's way of life. And a lot of the times the government just will not listen because they need the money that these corporations can give them. And a lot of these government projects too um, would make them like a lot of money and they care a lot about that. So they 
don't really listen to indigenous peoples and when they talk about the sort of issues that are happening to them. And that's often really bad. So there's just a lot of exploitation when it comes to companies and indigenous people. And there are just many examples of this over the history of Canada, even in like the last 20, 10 years. So a lot of crappy things. Um, and then basically, I did some research and I basically there's this, um, oh my gosh, I forgot the, what the acronym stands for, but it's the CCAB, which is basically a uh, group of indigenous activists who have like given out a sort of guidelines for how businesses can support reconciliation. Um, and this is out of like their guidelines basically. So they want, businesses to commit to meaningful consultation, building respectful relationships and obtaining the free prior and informed consent of indigenous people before proceeding with economic development projects. This basically means talking to the people who would be living on this land in order to get like actual consent from them before going ahead and deciding to build a pipeline. Um, ensuring that Aboriginal peoples have equitable access to jobs, training, and education opportunities in the corporate sector, and that Aboriginal communities gain long-term sustainable benefits from economic development projects. This just ensures that they're also able to benefit from the amount of money that they would be making off of their land. Um, providing education for management and staff on the history of Aboriginal people, including the history and legacy of residential school, the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People, Treaties and Aboriginal Rights, Indigenous Law and Aboriginal Crown Relations. Uh, this will require skills-based training in intercultural competency, conflict resolution, human rights, and anti-racism. And this would be a good first step. Um, and notice how I'm saying first step for businesses to reconcile the things that they have done. Because I got to be honest, the Truth and Reconciliation Committee and a lot of the, you know, recommendations that they have made and a lot of the things that the Canadian government needs to do just have not been completed. So it's always good for corporations to also try to do some of these things and they should definitely do these things. It's just a matter of fact of if they are going to or not, because these are all like not too difficult for corporations to do, um, but unfortunately, because of the incentives of corporations, they may not actually do that. But this is basically how um, like indigenous people have, or representatives of indigenous people have said business reconciliation can start. Um, so that's how that they interact in that specific sense. So now I wanna talk a little bit about feminism and it comes to corporations. So women in work. Okay, so I wanna talk a little bit about the wage gap, but I want to talk about the wage gap in a specific context, which is analyzing a little bit, and this is just like useful things to know about why there are certain jobs that are generally paid less, because the wage gap between a man and a woman uh, working in a specific field and the same job isn't as bad as what it looks like over like different types of work that is more gendered. And I guess I'll explain this. And I also want to note that this particular section when it comes to feminism is not the most inclusive because I will be mostly talking about women and not gender minorities, just because there are also a multitude of issues that those individuals face. But specifically on the topic of feminism, I do want to talk about how women in work interact. And this is important when it comes to corporations because that is necessarily where they're working. So why are there some jobs that are paid less? And why are these jobs typically regarded as feminine? So when it comes to gendered work, there has always been different types of jobs that can be associated with each gender. So for example, teaching is a big one of this. And I do believe that teaching is getting a little bit better, but teaching specifically when it comes to younger children, um, because a lot of professors and a lot of people are in academia are actually men. But when it comes to like high school, elementary teachers, a lot of these individuals are like, women and like people think of teaching as a more feminine career um and a lot of the times this means that there's like issues when it comes to the amount of money that they're paid um and i'm sure most of you guys will remember like the like a lot of strikes that have happened in like the past few years in regards to um 
like teaching benefits and things like that. Uh, so that is like a huge part of feminism in regards to like corporations or like feminism in regards to work in itself because those sort of things are viewed as less valuable and such things as like nursing and stuff like that and I guess I could talk a little bit about the historical context which is essentially that like because all of these jobs like teaching nursing whatever are seen as more nurturing and seen as something that like what a mother would do which is what the idea of femininity has been for a really long time which is like you got to be like motherly and stuff like that that means like when this actually devolves into work in itself it means that a lot of like more individuals um are pushed into these sort of fields if they are women and if they are viewed as more motherly um so that is definitely like a huge issue when it comes to how historically these jobs are like viewed, which means they're typically viewed as more value, or sorry, they're typically viewed as less valuable because femininity as a whole has been something that a lot of individuals have wanted to distance themselves from. There's a lot of things that happen, and things like internalized homophobia, things like gendered insults that exist, which is basically trying to separate yourself from the idea of femininity, um, which is, I guess, partially why these sort of jobs are viewed as less valuable um, and why the wage gap may exist in that certain sense. Uh, but also I want to talk specifically about lean in feminism because this is something that has a huge context in corporations itself. And corporations basically um, support lean in feminism, which is a more like a privileged version of feminism that seems more palatable to people. Basically, lean in feminism is the idea that if you work hard and you dream big and you want it enough, you'll be able to succeed, um, which a lot of the times is said by wealthy, white, and highly educated women um, because it ignores all the systematic barriers that women may have when it comes to working or when it comes to the sort of things that they're required to do or that the sort of things that they're like more likely to do, such as be a stay-at-home mom. But basically, it's the idea that women are responsible for their own success, which can be problematic because a lot of the times it ignores the fact that there are genuine barriers that may stop women from being able to be more successful. There are reasons why even in a family that have that like more well, like a heterosexual relationship family structure where the woman will often take more of the emotional labor and more of the household labor than the man even if they are both working um there's a reason why these sort of things happen um and the systematic stuff that exists there that lean and feminism doesn't actually talk about because then it puts the onus of success on these women instead of looking at the system that exists and thinking about how we can change the systems in order to make it more fair and it like touches and like puts too much responsibility on women in general but that is what lean and feminism is it's basically the idea that like oh i can do anything as long as i work hard which oftentimes not only doesn't always work because once again, systematic issues, but also just like, it means that when you don't succeed as someone who buys into lean and feminism, there's no place to place blame other than yourself, which can be really unfair to these individuals as well. So that's how corporations and feminism can sometimes intersect when it comes to lean and feminism and why lean and feminism overall is just not a really great view on how to view feminism. Um, okay, so let's talk about the hashtag Me Too movement because this definitely relates to companies. Corporations have had like a really bad history with sexual assault. Like I've read a lot of cases and stuff like that where individuals will like have like a corporation will have like a specific amount of money set aside in order to like cover their ass whenever a person like um, reports sexual assault, right? They'll just like give you a check and be like, this should pay for your trauma. Um, and then they send you on their way. But corporations overall have just had a really bad history with sexual assault. There's a lot of like workplace harassment, specifically when a man is like, 
in charge or is the boss and a lot of the times because men are more likely to be the person who is more dominant in a working relationship this ends up happening a lot and workplace harassment is just really bad because a lot of the time it also just happens in a situation where women are less incentivized to actually want to go out and like report this sort of thing. Um, so that's often how corporations have intersected with issues of feminism and how corporations can often make these sort of things worse. Um, okay, and lastly, I wanna talk a little bit about corporations and marketing because wow, the stereotypes and ads really does kill me a little. Like in a lot, like, okay, marketing wise, sex sells, which means that individuals who are in charge of marketing and i actually watched a really interesting video on the male gaze and how a lot of the things that we see we look at through the male gaze which isn't just about like sexualizing someone but it's just about how individuals are framed in like camera and how they're framed in a way that kind of like puts more emphasis on their body rather than their face. So if you look at a lot of different ads and things like that, a lot of the times when you see a woman in it, they'll be framed from like the shoulders down. Um, and then it'll typically like frame their body in a way that really is really objectifying. But those sort of things happen in every single like movie, these sort of things happen in every single ad. Um, and that is just how corporations, because they're so used to like, needing to abide by the fact that sex sells, um, the sort of stereotypes that they end up portraying in their ads um, can also be really harmful to things like feminism. And like, just like, there was this one ad that I once saw, which is basically just, and I think this happens a lot, especially in commercials that are geared more towards men. So in a lot of beer ads, there's gonna be like this one really, you know, fits to all of the beauty standards woman who is like drinking beer on a beach in a bikini right like that, that that's an ad that i'm sure we've all seen but these sort of like ways that corporations choose to frame like women and choose to frame individual sexuality in order to sell the product is something that is related to feminism and something that isn't really great and then I want to talk about gendered products because, oh boy, do they annoy me. Um, there's just a lot of products overall that are just unnecessarily gendered. And I think I have a few examples of them on the next slide. But this is also how corporations then um, interact with how feminism works and what feminism wants to solve in regards to corporations, how corporations are just really not good for feminism overall. Um, so yeah, quick interlude. Why there's like, a gendered stool softener, I will never know. Why there's gendered like earplugs, I will also never know. But yes, it's not great. Um, and this is just another example of how corporations and feminism necessarily interact with each other. Um, and then I wanna talk a little bit about feminism and capitalism. There's a specific de debate motion, which is like this house believes that feminism is incompatible with capitalism. And I wanted to talk a little bit about that um, and maybe explain a little bit of how like, capitalism can be something that is inherently patriarchal. So what are the goals of capitalism? Capitalism is a system that really rewards selfishness because no matter what, your, I guess, worth in capitalism is like equivalent to the amount of output that you're able to produce. So it's very profit driven, it's very productivity driven, it is very comp competition, sorry, it's very competitive, like you're always competing with other individuals. Um, and like the goal of capitalism in itself can be seen as something that is like more um, in tone with like the patriarchy and the way that they view certain things, which is also what work is valuable because um, a lot of the times the sort of things that you guys like you don't get paid for. So sexism makes women's unpaid labor in the home, which is essential to society appear more natural and a labor of love instead of assigning it with like the value that um, a lot of other work can be assigned, right? So a lot of the things that you would see what is viewed as something that a woman's role is in a very patriarchal society when it comes to what they should be doing inside the house, whether that be cleaning, taking care of the kids. These are all things that like 
people don't get paid for it. Like they inherently like don't get paid for the sort of work that they're putting in at home. And because a lot of the time that like rests on the women itself, it oftentimes means that um, capitalism in itself and viewing what work is valuable can't be compatible with the sort of feminism ideas that exist when it comes to making sure that individuals are compensated for the labor that they're doing. Um, and also like, Finally, briefly, um, another reason why capitalism could be incompatible with feminism is that it can often be impossible to be create meaningful change. Because with the goals of capitalism that I just talked about, corporations and capitalism will always be concerned mostly with the profit that they can make, which means they will never be concerned with the well-being of women. They will never be concerned with how they're going to be able to make like everything as equitable as possible because that inherently goes against their beliefs on profit and like their beliefs on um, like competition and things like that because of the fact that they're going to value things like being able to make as much money as possible, then that means that a lot of the time they might just straight up not care about the well-being of women at the end of the day, because that isn't something that is going to bring them a lot of money. So that is another reason that feminism and capitalism could be incompatible. And I just want you guys to just note down this slide really quickly, just because I'm sure this motion will come up at some point, and it's probably good to know some sort of arguments that you can make in order to support the idea that feminism and capitalism cannot be um, compatible. So yes. All right. Finally, I'm going to lose my voice. I'm sorry for keeping you here for so long. But finally, I want to talk a little bit about, about environmental issues, which I think is like mostly self-explanatory, because a lot of this is just going to be on corporations and climate change. So one big thing that I want to talk about is how climate change is typically seen as an individual issue, or like a lot of the time where climate change is discussed and the ways that climate change is sort of like seen as an issue, it always calls upon individual change. It always calls upon everyone to take little steps that they can in order to combat climate change, whether that means trying to like live a more waste-free life, turning off the lights, um, like, you know, replacing plastic in your house with other sort of like things. But it fundamentally misses the point that corporations are where most of the greenhouse gases are emitted and corporations are where most of the damage to climate, the climate it comes from because of the factories, because of like, you know, for example, the meat industry, how much that in regards to the amount of resources it takes to like raise a cow and like produce that much beef and how that is essentially related to how much greenhouse gases are em emitted. So climate change is often seen as an individual issue, but that ignores the root of the problem. And then I want to talk a little bit about how there's really no ethical consumption under corporation when it comes to wanting to help things like climate change, because it's really difficult to limit your personal effects on climate change when most companies are owned by a select few major ones, which I will show you guys on the next slide. But because of the fact that there's these blanket companies that owns everything, no matter where you purchase things from, even if it is like something that is vegan or something that is green and always leads back to profiting individuals who are still the ones who are ruining our climate. So, Lastly, how do we get corporations to change? The biggest thing that we would be able to do is make corporations lose profit, but this is super hard to do when everything you would need to purchase from comes from a few blanking companies anyways, right? Like just because you're going to be spending less money towards this specific corporation doesn't mean that it doesn't end up going to the blanket corporation at the top because a lot of the time what you're gonna be purchasing will come from there instead. So. I've talked a lot about this graphic, but I do want to show you guys it really quickly. Um, I want to call out PepsiCo real quick because I know someone here used to work for them. But if you take a look at this graphic, all of these small brands and all of these brands and like parts of it that um, like may seem more green and more ethical are all still related to these big companies that end up harming a lot of these, um, you know, climate initiatives or whatever. So yeah, that is in regards to environmental issues. And I do believe this is the last slide. Yes, it is. But yes, thank you so much, everyone, for listening. I know this was a long one, um, but there is just a lot of different ways that social issues then interact with corporations. And I'd be happy to answer 
any questions you guys may have about anything that I've talked about. And I'm really thankful you guys took all this time to listen to me.